Welcome to this crash course on the uh, functions of the brain. Um, basically my feeling is that it's pointless going in too much detail in, uh, in terms of the anatomy and the functions of the nuclei of the brain stem and so forth. And what I'm going to rather do is give you a general overview of the functions of the brain um, in such a way that it's easy to understand and that you'll be able to easily apply it clinically uh, to the future. So you might not remember exactly what nuclei are on the pons, for example, but you'll still be able to remember roughly what the pons does and be able to quickly um, make clinical assumptions based on the knowledge from um, this little lecture. So let's go on. So I find it the easiest to explain the brain by looking at the uh, sort of mid sagittal section of the brain because you quickly see a lot of structures of the brain on the mid sagittal section. And generally, the brain is traditionally divided into three parts the brain stem, which is that bit of the brain that's sort of perched on the top of the spine. So that's the brain stem, mid brain pons, and ob uh, medulla oblongata. Uh, the cerebellum which is two lobes um, over here, and then the cerebrum, which is pretty much the rest of the brain. Another peculiar region is the diencephalon, uh, which is this area, which depending on which textbook you read is either classified as part of the brain stem, or in the older textbooks is classified as part of the cerebrum, or uh, some people just classify it as a separate region of the brain in and of itself because there are some unique functions um, that actually make it sort of a halfway state between brainstem and cerebrum. So for the sake of this lecture I'm going to consider it to be a separate part of the brain. One thing to note, um, your brain basically starts off as a stalk. So we've got the stalk of the brainstem and the stalk is basically sort of like a pillar and every structure in this pillar is there's just one of these structures. So you only have one medulla oblongata, you only have one pons, you only have one midbrain, you only have one hypothalamus, you only have one pituitary gland. And then once you move beyond this uh, sort of border of the uh, hypothalamus and the posterior brainstem, everything starts to duplicate. Uh, so you have two cerebellar hemispheres, two cerebral hemispheres, and you have two uh, thalami, <coughs> two thalami, because um, so everything starts to duplicate. And as it duplicates, it also becomes more complex. We'll see that um, the brain is at its simplest over here, at the most distal end, and as you move uh, more towards um, the cortex, your brain becomes more and more complex in terms of structure and uh, and function. Uh, other thing to sort of note is that uh, the sort of distal parts of the brain are evolutionarily ancient structures. Um, so structures uh, over here are, have been evolving for billions of years and as you move towards the cortex, your structures become younger and younger, and our, uh, our oblongatas are about a billion years old in, ter uh, in terms of evolution, but our cortices are only a few million years old in terms of evolution. And, of, and our cerebellum is also more evolutionarily old than our uh, cerebrum, for example. And this is a good to keep in mind, because it's going to help us remember the functions of the different parts of the brain. So we're going to basically go through the evolutionary history of the brain because I think that's the easiest way to remember the different parts uh, or the different functions of different regions of the brain. So we're going to start by thinking about um, ants and we're going to, uh, reason I'm uh, we're looking at ants because we're looking at the medulla oblongata and believe it or not even ants have a medulla oblongata. The rest of the brain looks completely nothing like our brains but even ants have a, uh, have a medulla. And if you think about the ant, uh, an ant doesn't need to have language, an ant doesn't really need to have much in the way of emotion, an ant doesn't need to philosophize and uh, go to church and pray, um, and so forth. Uh, an ant's brain has some pretty simple functions that it needs to accomplish in order for the ant to be an ant. Um, 
if you think about the ant's body, it has a, ants have hearts, so they need something to control the circulatory system. Uh, they need something. They have lungs, so they need to co uh, control the respiratory system. Uh, they do have a, a, s a rudimentary sleep-wake cycle, so there needs to be something there to control awakeness. And the way ants move, they mostly rely on reflexes um, to move their legs and um, and to react to the environment. So uh, they need a brain that is able to control a lot of motoric reflexes. Um, and they need to be able to interact with the environment, so they need to be able to um, uh, have some touch uh, ability and be able to feel temperature and taste uh, and feel pain. Um, and sort of basically very rudimentary things. And if we look at the human medulla oblongata, the human medulla oblongata does all these rudimentary things that the medulla oblongata does in the ant brain as well. Um, so when you're looking at the medulla oblongata, you need to think about what are those rudimentary things that are necessary f just to maintain life for a very simple organism. Okay, so we've got our medulla oblongata here in the human brain, and we know that the medulla oblongata does um, similar functions in both humans and ants, and we know ants um, can't do much in the way of complex things, there. so this medulla oblongata needs to be a fairly controlled, fairly simple, although important, um, processes. So you'll notice that in the medulla oblongata all our um, cardiac centers that control uh, our pulse, for example, and our heartbeats, uh, respiratory centers to control um, our breathing uh, processes. Uh, there's the beginning of the reticular formation to control awakeness. Um, a lot of motoric responses are available in the medulla oblongata, things like vomiting, um, sneezing, coughing, very basic sort of um, motoric responses, or maps not basic, but common um, rhetoric responses. Uh, there's also some control of the mouth. So the, uh, in the human, medulla oblongata is also important for, uh, for speech in terms of controlling how the mouth moves and all the um, motoric movement of the mouth. And um, it also contains um, uh, nuclei that are involved in touch, uh, pressure, temperature, taste and pain, basic sort of uh, sensory input. And of course uh, the medulla oblongata, indeed the whole brainstem of self, one of the functions is to carry all the tracts from the cerebrum through, the, uh, through itself and into the spine and towards the body. So that is the sort of last function of the uh, medulla oblongata. Okay, so what, what happens if something goes wrong with the uh, medulla oblongata? Well, probably, uh, I think the easiest sort of ex most vivid example to give you would be that of the syndrome called coning. What happens is that if you have a brain injury and there's a, or there's a massive tumor in your brain and pressure builds up within the skull, eventually the brain starts getting um, squeezed out of the skull through the foramen magnum. And the first part of the brain that's going to get squeezed out is the medulla oblongata. And as the medulla oblongata is crushed uh, on it by the edges of the foramen magnum, those um, pulse and respiratory centers are then suppressed. Um, and those awakeness centers are also suppressed. So typically, patient with coding is going to be unconscious in a coma because awakeness is suppressed. Um, they're going to have an extremely slow pulse, pulse rate. Um, when I remember when uh, first time I saw coning or recognized coning, the pulse rate uh, dropped from 80 to 30 beats per minute, so uh, very slow bradycardia. And the uh, respiration can also become uh, um, uh, suppressed um, as part of the coning syndrome. So that's a vivid sort of clinical example of, um, uh, of how uh, injury to the medulla oblongata can um, affect uh, the clinical presentation uh, in a patient. I think one of the things I forgot to mention uh, in the previous slide is that in the medulla oblongata there's also the soli solitary tract nucleus which um, is the pathway for your, all your taste sensations as they enter the central nervous system. So um, all the nerves from the tongue go into the medulla oblongata at the solitary tract nucleus and then uh, move up the um, 
the brainstem to eventually reach um, the brain. So that's another important aspect of what the medulla oblongata does. Um, it's there also for taste, um, which can also be considered a vital sort of simple life function. Uh, even ants need to be able to taste the difference between sugar and salt uh, in order to decide uh, what to raid uh, on your picnic table. Um, and if you have a uh, lesion in the medulla oblongata, so perhaps a brain tumor, it can cause abnormalities in taste perception. Uh, I heard of one patient who um, had a metallic, constant metallic taste in half his, of his tongue, and it turns out that on the one side of his brain stem he was actually having a tumor. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so now we're moving up the evolutionary ladder and we're moving up to brain structures that are held more in common between us and various other uh, species. So we have the medulla in common with uh, insects and not much else. Uh, but now let's move up the ladder to amphibians. So this is an image of the Japanese giant salamander, uh, a fairly um, old uh, creature in terms of evolution but still alive today in Japan. And this is an amphibious creature. It lives partly in water and partly on land. And one of the things that creatures had to develop as they uh, started exploring more on the land more is that they had to develop far more intense um, sort of innervation and control over their faces. So um, the next part of the brain you'll see is peculiarly obsessed with control of the face. Uh, control of eyes and control of ears, which I'm sure the little giant salamander has here on the sides. So when we go to the next two regions of the brain, which is the pons and the midbrain, take note that what mainly what they are involved with is with um, uh, input from the face and motoric output to the face. So there's a lot um, of stuff involving vision and hearing and um, facial motor control and facial sensation. That's not to say they do all the work, but they actually do quite a substantial amount of work um, independently of the cerebrum. So let's have a closer look at what they do. So the next two structures I'm discussing are the pons and the midbrain, what I call the face brain, or uh, because amphibians were the first sort of creatures to develop faces, uh, I like to call this the amphibious brain. And starting with the pons, okay, obviously as um, obviously uh, as I think I mentioned on a previous slide. Um, there are tracts carrying um, signals, motor signals and sensory uh, input up and down the brain stem. So that's part of the function of the pons. The pons also has um, uh, what we call transverse fascicles which connect the left and right parts of the cerebrum. So the pons besides um, having the sort of evolutionary ancient functions of controlling the face um, also has uh, connections to uh, connect this relatively newer structure uh, in terms of evolution. Now the pons uh, mainly conduct signals from different uh, cranial nerves, so not much happens uh, in the pons that the pons does independently of the rest of the brain, but it has synapses for cranial nerve 5, and that is the facial nerve, uh, oh sorry, the trigeminal nerve, uh, cranial nerve 6, the abducens nerve, so it's controlled in uh, has partial control of the movement of the eye, um, cranial nerve 7, that's the facial nerve, and cranial nerve 8, um, the vestibular cochlear nerve. And the pons is particularly important in uh, transmission of signals from the vestibular cochlear nerve. There are two nuclei in the pons uh, for the vestibular cochlear nerve, and damage to the pons can actually affect your the functioning of the vestibular cochlear uh, nerve especially. And um, the pons um, can also control the rate of signals going through through itself, so it can somewhat control the function of those cranial nerves. And especially uh, with the vestibular cochlear nerve, it has a lot of um, feedback nerves that go back into the ear that, for example, control the tension of the eardrum uh, and control the, the flow of signals uh, going uh, from the ear and also help with balance. The pons also contains uh, the reticular formation uh, that started the medulla oblongata. So the pons is also uh, involved in regulating your sleep, um, 
part of uh, the reticular formation's functions uh, along with sleep are respiration, so it controls your respiratory rate, slows it down when you're sleeping, and part of the reticular formation is to make sure you're awake when you need to be awake, and part of being awake is having a t um, much uh, better postural tone, so that reticular formation controls postural tone, so the pons is also involved in postural tone. So you think about it, uh, uh, a lot of the pons is involved with the face, it's uh, partly involved in the eye with the abducens nerve, and it's he heavily involves the ears through the vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, if you think about an amphibian, a horse has to have a spine that's uh, plucked onto the, uh, has to have a head that's plucked onto a spine, so it also needs postural control. So again, we have that reticular uh, formation. Moving up to the midbrain. Uh, the midbrain has uh, sort of several regions. This region is referred to as the tectum. And the tectum has four little bumps on it. So now we're actually reaching a point in the brain where we're starting to pair up. Uh, so we only have one midbrain, but at the back there's, um, we start having pairs of structures instead of just a single structure. And there are four of these structures, two pairs. Uh, they're referred to as the corpora uh, quadrigemina, um, and those are the four bulges, if you had to loosely translate that Latin term, and they're divided into the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. And again, we're still mostly dealing with face, eyes, and ears, and to some extent posture. So uh, the superior colliculi control uh, the eyes. Um, the ocular motor nerve uh, originates not far from the superior colliculi, so all the movements of the eyes are basically controlled in this region. Um, the other things that the colliculi control are uh, the uh, reflexes involving the eyes, such as being able to track a moving object, that's partly a reflexive thing, uh, being able to pay attention to something that you are uh, looking at, and those visual attention. And various visual reflexes are controlled by the superior colloquially, such as blinking and uh, being able to focus uh, the size of the pupils, and also if your head suddenly turns um, from a s um, sudden thing that you saw, um, then uh, that's due to superior colloquially. So if you see a bright flash and you turn towards the flash, that's then you can blame your su superior colloquially. It was a reflex movement. If something is thrown at your face and you reflexively blink, then again you can blame your superior colloquially. <laughs> so if you think about an amphibian, an amphibian has eyes, so it needs to have lots of reflexes to control its eyes. It doesn't have much of a brain in terms of a cerebrum, so it can't do it consciously, so it has to have the superior, the superior colloquially that do these things automatically, and we've inherited the superior colloquially and all those automatic responses. If our superior colloquially are for the eyes, then our inferior colloquially are for the ears, and um, they will control basically auditory reflexes. Um, so, for example, if you hear a loud noise and you jump or you turn your head towards that loud noise, you can blame your inferior colloquially, and your inferior colloquially also play a huge role in um, um, transmitting sounds uh, from the pons through to the thalamus, where they eventually can be s uh, relayed to the cerebrum. Our midbrain um, also has peduncles, which are regions that connect the midbrain or anchor the midbrain to the cerebrum. And these peduncles contain uh, tracts, and there's three major tracts the cerebral crus. Uh, which is not, so obviously I'm not going to be showing you the tracks, but let's briefly go over the tracks. We've got the cerebral crus, um, which contains all the corticospinal tracks and has all the motor, major gross motor output of the brain. There's the tegmentum, which contains tracts for fine motor movement. And then what's clinically relevant is the substantia nigra, uh, which is an area that's full of the, um, dopamine, and it inhibits unnecessary um, body movements. And, and uh, I'll discuss that briefly on the next slide for the clinical sort of examples. Other sort of important things to note, um, there's periaqueductal tissue in the midbrain that has reticulospinal tracts, which are for pain transmission. Um, and then 
There's also the trochlear nucleus in the midbrain, uh, so the trochlea and the abducens and oculomotor uh, nerves are the ones responsible for eye movement. So now we've covered all the cranial nerves that are, are important for the movement of the eyes, and even amphibians have all these uh, cranial nerves in order to move their eyes. So we've covered all these sort of evolutionary ancient uh, structures. After all, um, the eyes sort of developed before our um, cortices developed. So obviously we have to have control of the eyes at the uh, evolutionary oldest part of the brain. Um, there's also a sort of um, structure called the red nucleus um, in the midbrain, which is uh, also the origin of the rubrospinal tract. Um, it is unclear whether this red nucleus does anything in humans. Um, in animals such as amphibians, it's responsible for a lot of postural control and for control of movements as they walk around. Uh, it appears that the red nucleus is a sort of evolutionary um, leftover from that and doesn't seem to do much uh, in the human brain because even if there's damage to the red nucleus from a stroke or so or whatever, it doesn't seem to have much of an effect. But that is still somewhat controversial. But for all intents and purposes, the red nucleus at the moment does not seem to have a function in human anatomy and physiology. Okay, so let's discuss a few clinical examples that illustrate the uh, function of the pons in the midbrain. Um, sort of the classical sort of um, case study for um, for a stroke sort of presentation is a patient who comes with severe dizziness. Uh, lots of risk factors for stroke, and you examine the ears, and the uh, ears look abs absolutely normal. Um, well, then, then what is causing this dizziness? And then, because you know about this lecture, and you know that the pons has nuclei for the vestibular cochlear nerve, and you know the vestibular cochlear nerve is for hearing and for balance, you know, okay, well, maybe this person has had a stroke in their pons, which is affecting their vestibular cochlear nerve function and uh, con affecting their sense of balance, which I know the pons is, is, is um, uh, all about, and maybe that's what's causing their dizziness. And then you do a uh, MRI eye scan and they see the stroke and you're a hero because you recognize the stroke and you uh, send the patient to a neurologist and a neurologist managed to treat the stroke uh, very well um, as opposed to your colleague who didn't look at this lecture and thought it might just be a funny ear infection and sent the patient home to have a worsening and worsening stroke. And then, um, for example, a stroke in the midbrain might cause problems with eye movement, or a tumor in the midbrain might cause problems with eye movement, and so forth. Um, that and then, uh, for example, with Parkinson's disease, um, you might have deterioration of the substantia nigra in the uh, in that midbrain. Um, and with the damage to substantia migra, um, you uh, lose that inhibition of unnecessary body movements, and then you start developing those flapping body movements due to that uh, loss of that inhibition. So in that sense, the midbrain is not only about the face, eyes, and ears, and posture, um, also a little bit in uh, uh, it's also a little bit involved in um, in control of that um, body um, in general. And those are just a few examples just to illustrate uh, the functionings of the rest of the brain stem. <coughs> okay, so we're moving further up into the uh, diencephalon now. And um, this is what we can call the, um, the reptilian brain. Um, and the diencephalon between humans and reptiles is quite similar, and they do similar functions. Basically, we're looking at creatures now that have evolved out of an amphibious state and now spend most of their time on land, and that comes with certain challenges. On land, you have to run around hunting and looking for food. Um, you're vulnerable to thirst. You, your body's physiology needs to adapt to different land uh, temperatures and conditions. I mean, the temperature in water tends to stay more or less the same, and in coastal areas, it's more or less the same, but on land, is a wide variety of climates. Um, and seasons and even day-to-day -day variations. So you need a much you need something to regulate your body temperature and uh, the autonomic nervous system that uh, plays such a vital part in body temperature. You need to hunt for food. So you need to uh, be able to fight 
uh, for food um, at times. So there's some basic sort of emotions involved, um, such as rage and anger, and um, you need to be able to uh, sexually reproduce, so the diencephalon is also involved in that, and you need parts of the brain to regulate a sleep-wake cycle and the epithalamus, and you also need the thalamus to be able to uh, communicate um, all these different um, sort of functions with the rest of the brain and the body. So the diencephalon, or the reptilian brain, as I like to call it, it consists of the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, thalamus, and epithalamus. Note that um, we start off as a column structure in the brain, and then once we get to the sort of junction between the hypothalamus and the thalamus, we move from having a column-like structure to having a bilateral structure. So you have only one hypothalamus, but you have two thalami sitting together side by side, connected by this interthalamic bridge. And then as we move further away, the structures become more and more separated. Starting with our hypothalamus, our hypothalamus um, allows us to survive on land. It uh, controls our autonomic nervous system, adjusting our blood pressure, our sweating, our pulse rates as necessary in response to the environment. It regulates our body temperature, because unlike fish whose body temperatures are controlled by the water, we on land need to have um, some more complex mechanisms to control our body temperature because of the varieties of climates and temperatures we experience. Uh, for on land, we need to look for water, so the hypothalamus controls thirst and uh, water-seeking behavior. Um, we also need food, so hypothalamus regulates hunger um, and um, and the need to um, go get food. Um, on land, we have a day and night cycle, so sleep is regulated by the hypothalamus and certain circadian rhythms. Um, if we're sleeping, then our hormones need to go up and down depending on our activity level, so the hypothalamus regulates um, hormone secretion. And the hypothalamus is, uh, regulates certain basic emotions, um, specifically rage and pleasure. So you have to feel angry because someone is stealing your food. Um, and you have to feel pleasure at eating nice food. Um, so the hypothalamus has those basic emotions to help control your food and water intake. So if you are very thirsty and it's a hot day and you finally manage to get a cool glass of water and you feel a distinct sense of pleasure from drinking this cool glass of water, you can blame your hypothalamus. Uh, hypothalamus also regulates the uh, sexual responses, uh, so sexual hormones and things like orgasm. Um, and it regulates hormones in general. And uh, it also, the, the, on the posterior part of the hypothalamus is something called the mammillary body. Uh, which plays a role in memory. And if you think about reptiles, they, they too need to remember more or less where they're going to get water from where and uh, where are the good spots to hunt. So even they need some basic memory functions. So some basic memory functions are present in the mammillary body of the hypothalamus. We're moving on to the pituitary gland, which consists of an anterior part and a posterior part. The anterior part is the Dina hypothesis. And the Dino hypothesis actually consists of tissue that embryologically migrated from the throat and migrated upwards. Um, and as such, it's more of a hormone secreting um, uh, portion of the pituitary gland. The posterior part is a direct outgrowth of the brain. And it also secretes hormones. But the way the hormones are secreted is that they're released by nerve endings uh, in the posterior pituitary gland. So the anterior pituitary gland, because it's migrated away from the throat um, embryologically, it doesn't it's not it's sort of glued to the brain, but it's not actually it doesn't have any actual direct connections um, into the brain. Uh, but it does have some blood vessel connections um, between itself and the hypothalamus. So the way the hypothalamus regulates the anterior pituitary gland, the hypothalamus secretes some hormones and then these go through the into the hypophysial portal system 
which goes through portal venules and then into capillaries into anterior um, hypothesis and then these hormones then regulate uh, or stimulate the secretion of different substances by the adenohypothesis. In contrast, the neurohypothesis is uh, directly wired by nerves running from the hypothalamus and what happens is that hormo the, the hormones released by the posterior pituitary gland are actually made in the hypothalamus and they are actually sent through the axons of the nerves into the posterior hypothalamus and when necessary it's released from the posterior hypothalamus through nerve signals and the sort of big uh, hormones released by the posterior hypothesis are your um, oxytocin and your antidiuretic hormone. Moving on to the thalamus over here. So the thalamus is, consists of two egg-shaped structures sitting on top of the column of brain tissue and the hypothalamus uh, is basically the router of the brain. The hypothalamus doesn't really do any functioning um, in and of itself, but rather it takes signals from different parts of the brain and relays it to, uh, to wherever it needs to be. So if you think about the internet and your computer, your computer needs to connect to an internet service provider or cell phone tower if you're using mobile internet and that tower needs to then send your signal to the correct place so if you're trying to download something off an American website your computer will send a signal to the tower that tower sends a signal to the American website and that American website will then send a signal back to the uh, cell phone tower or to your internet service provider which then sends this information back to your computer so the thalamus works in a similar way information for example might go um, from the midbrain into the uh, thalamus and then from the thalamus the thalamus knows then it has to be routed to whichever part of the brain the midbrain is trying to communicate and vice versa signals might have might going to the midbrain might have to go through the thalamus to be routed and to go into the correct place now the thalamus is has many nuclei and each nuclei in the thalamus has a specific function but as a rule of thumb you can divide it into five groups uh, the anterior uh, thalamus is more involved in the memory emotion um, and we consider it to be part of the limbic system which is the emotional system of the brain the posterior part is more for vision and for auditory uh, signals so that kind of makes sense of vis for vision because our occipital lobe is responsible for vision so we want the visual pathways to be sort of as short as possible uh, from the thalamus and then the medial side also is involved in emotions and then the top part the sort of ventral side or not sorry not the not the top part the bottom part the ventral side of the thalamus the bottom part uh, is involved in moving signals between the cerebellum basal nuclei and the motor control parts of the uh, cerebral cortex and basically um, output of motor uh, components of the brain so the motor parts of the brain will send signals to move your hand and will send it via the uh, ventral part of the thalamus and eventually and then via the thalamus is going to go forth into the uh, brain stem and spine eventually reach your hand and then the lateral parts of the thalamus um, are involved to, uh, with um, moving of connecting different parts of your cer uh, cerebral cortex and also for emotional sort of output so if you're feeling happy the lateral part of the thalamus will send a signal to your face for you to give us a big smile and the last part of the diencephalon is the epithalamus which consists of two structures a very tiny structure over here called the pineal gland which secretes melatonin which seems to have something to do with the sleep-wake cycle seems to go up when you need to sleep and down when you're awake which is a uh, sort of opposite of all the other hormones other hormones tend to be less when you're asleep and more when you're awake and then the habenula which uh, doesn't, start, doesn't really do too much it relays signals 
from the midbrain to the emotional centers of the brain and the limbic system. So it really sends signals from the midbrain through the habenula to the emotional system. So it's uh, responsible for that you know, shocking feeling of fright you have um, if uh, you hear a loud noise. So if you have a loud noise, um, your inferior colloquy in the midbrain are going to cause you to jump and they're also immediately going to send a signal via your habenula to your limbic system so that you feel frightened. And all this happens even before the loud noise um, reaches your frontal cortex so that you can make a decision about what that uh, noise is all about. And that's the epithalamus. I'm just going to mention quickly while we hear um, the corpus callosum, which connects the two cerebral hemispheres together. Um, and that's pretty much all it does. And next up, we're going to move on to the cerebrum. Okay, so let's go through um, a few sort of clinical examples that illustrate. Um, the physiology of um, the diencephalon. Um, one sort of clinical entity that is nice to know about is neurogenic fever. Neurogenic fever is when there's brain damage or tumor in your hypothalamus that upsets the that affects the thermoregulatory centers of the brain, and because of that damage, um, the the body's is strug um, struggling the body loses ability to maintain a sort of um, temperature point of around about 36.4 degrees Celsius, and then your body temperature might rise up to 38, 39 degrees Celsius, even though you're not actually sick with an uh, infection or anything, and you just walk around with this sort of permanent fever um, all the time. And it's pointless giving you Panado and Disprin and other medications to control the fever because all those medications work on the thermoregulatory centers of the brain, which are in the hypothalamus, and they are damaged, so it's um, you cannot pump medication into a damaged area of the brain. Uh, and even if the medication is there, all the tissue is damaged and dead, so it's not going to actually have a proper effect. So these people walk around with high temp body temperatures and they can't take any antipyretic because it doesn't really work for them. And it's a problem because to maintain that high body temperature, you're constantly burning off calories and you have to constantly eat and eat and you end up losing weight anyway because uh, of that constant high uh, body temperature requiring constant burning of calories. Damage to the hypothalamus might mess up your sleep rhythms, your circadian rhythms, uh, it can cause hormone abnormalities, um, uh, also emotional disturbances, a tumor in the hypothalamus might predispose someone to emotional outbursts of rage. A tumor of the pituitary gland uh, might cause too many hormones to be made. Uh, classically, the growth hormone uh, is uh, elevated, causing gigantism due to a pituitary uh, tumor. On the other hand, you might have the opposite. You might have pituitary failure, and all those hormones that are secreted into the body fail, and then um, what often happens is that um, especially the thyroid hormone drop is quite prevalent and these patients are diagnosed as having hypothyroidism and they're given altroxin but that only partly solves the problem sometimes you have complete and total pituitary gland failure and they develop other problems as well um, and not just the thyroid problem and sometimes GPs are a bit confused because they're treating the hypothyroidism but the patients are developing other abnormalities as well and at that point you should actually if you suspect c complete pituitary gland failure should actually refer the patient to an endocrinologist uh, if there's problems with thalamus, um, that's obviously going to mess up the ability of different parts of the brain to communicate with one another. Um, schizophrenic patients seem to have um, slight degeneration of their thalami, um, and that somewhat um, uh, confirms a sort of clinical picture of schizophrenia where it seems that they're um, that different parts of their brains are almost operating independently of one another and that causes very nonsensical activities uh, on the part of the schizophrenic uh, person. So it might be actually that uh, one of the problems with schizophrenia is that the different parts of the brain are not able to communicate with one another, integrate everything into one cli clinical picture or one sort of picture in order for the patient to interact with the environment and that partly uh, uh, contributes to the presentation of the clinical picture of schizophrenia. And then with that um, 
pineal gland with the melatonin. Abnormalities of the pineal gland can cause problems with the uh, melatonin excretion, and that seems to cause sleep uh, prob uh, wake cycle problems in patients that have that damage to the pineal gland, whether it's from a tumor or from some other condition. Next part of the brain is the cerebellum, which I call the bird brain. Um, we're not going to discuss it in detail in this lecture because I have another lecture scheduled specifically for the cerebellum where we'll go into far more detail. Um, but the, just to briefly note that the cerebellum is um, designed and especially well developed in creatures that have to move through three dimensional space. So it's particularly well developed in birds and uh, monkeys and, uh, and humans. Um, or basically any creature that um, uh, routinely has to interact with objects in a three dimensional way. So, um, and not only that, uh, but it's also responsible for smooth rhythmic movements. If you think of a bird flapping its wings and flying smoothly through the air, that's smooth rhythmical movement. And as you can see, this eagle is busy singing the song of its people. Um, the cerebellum is also responsible for rhythm melody, which has implications for uh, language in humans. But these will be discussed in more detail in the cerebellum lecture. So we've basically moved up the evolutionary ladder, going from our most ancient structures, which uh, we share in common with even with uh, insects, and climbing up the evolutionary ladder to structures that we as humans share fairly um, uh, uh, similarly with amphibians, uh, with creatures that have had to um, develop faces, and then as creatures went on to land and became reptiles or structures from the such as the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are quite similar between reptiles and humans um, as we had to evolve into creatures that walk through go through three-dimensional space and interact with three-dimensional environments we had to develop a cerebellum and the bird cerebellum and human cerebellum are quite similar and now we're going on to sort of the newest structures in the brain in, term in an evolutionary sense structures that we only really um, share in common with um, other mammals. It's not to say other creatures don't also have a cerebrum and some of these structures, but they're particularly well developed in mammals and they're particularly similar um, in structure and under the microscope if you compare humans uh, with mammals. So a lot, um, the next parts of the brain that we're going to go through are um, is can be referred to as the mammalian brain as such. And the mammalian brain is divided uh, into four parts, but um, I think I'm going to uh, discuss that in a bit more detail in the next slide. Uh, but when you were talking about these structures, I want you to think about mammals and how mammals uh, operate. Um, mammals operate in packs, um, on herds, uh, for the most part. And in order to have a sense of belonging to a pack or to a herd, you need to have some sort of sense of emotion that I belong. Uh, to this pack, to this herd, so uh, there's parts for emotion. Uh, if you're hunting in a pack or trying to coordinate escaping from predators as a herd, you need to be able to have a slightly better uh, systems to plan ahead. So uh, for that we have a frontal lobe and we are now, now develop far more complex ways of interacting with our environments. Not only do we interact with the environment, uh, but we also have emotions about the environment and we have to plan things in response to the environment and we therefore have s structures that um, um, are more comp complex to allow us to take all these different inputs to make a plan of action, as it were. So uh, let's start at the bottom. We're doing the mammalian brain. We're doing the cerebrum. And the cerebrum consists of five lobes. Temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, and um, deep to the temporal lobe is another lobe called the insular lobe, which is not pictured. Starting with the temporal lobe, which is separated by the horizontal fissure, or the deep lateral sulcus actually. And the temporal lobe has um, uh, court, uh, parts of it uh, are d uh, deal with hearing, uh, deals with smell, deals with memory and it has a major role to play with emotion. So if you feel like running in a wolf pack or being part of a herd, uh, you can blame your temporal lobe for giving you that feeling of belonging. Uh, if you remember where the watering hole is or you remember where to, uh, where's the good hunting grounds, you can 
blend with temporal lobe for its memory functions and um, if you can uh, smell the fear of your prey or if you can smell the predator coming after you you can blame your temporal lobe and if you're listening to hear if there's any predators in the grass or uh, possibly any prey in the grass then you can blame your temporal lobe so the temporal lobe is quite useful for uh, any uh, creature with a complex body that has to uh, operate in packs or herds um, in the wild the insular lobe that lies deep into the temporal lobe is a bit more mysterious um, because it's difficult to monitor with an EEG because EEGs can only monitor surface lobes so to monitor the insular lobe you have to actually do brain surgery to insert some EEG electrodes um, um, it's only with functional now MRI scans um, that some idea of its function has um, been formed uh, but even that, uh, even so, it still remains a somewhat mysterious um, structure. The insular lobe um, seems to be involved though mainly in integration of uh, different sensations. So it receives in some information from the visceral receptors um, around your stomach and your uh, intestines for example, it receives information from your tongue and it receives information from your nose. So it seems to be intimately involved with um, uh, with sensations around food and consumption of food. Um, for example, if you've ever noticed wha uh, that food tastes better when you're feeling hungry, it's because you're, uh, it seems to be due to act uh, activity of your insular lobe st uh, that's sort of uh, augmenting sensations coming in from your tongue. Or have you noticed that food is somewhat tasteless when your nose is blocked? That's because when your insula integrates uh, information coming in from your olfactory nerve from your nose, integrates the information coming from your tongue uh, to generate um, uh, a taste sensation as a combination of those two. So when your nose is blocked, uh, food actually doesn't taste as intensely um, because the insula is not receiving that information from the olfactory nerve. And it also seems to have some uh, function um, with regards to language, but exactly how it affects language is still somewhat mysterious. Our occipital lobe, uh, not much to say about that, it's responsible for vision and it, in deaf people it seems to be, or well, not in deaf people, in blind people, it seems to be responsible for um, developing sort of three-dimensional maps in your sort of mind's eye. Um, so um, with blind people, if you do brain scans of uh, them um, as they are walking um, uh, um, or listening to sounds coming in from different directions, the occipital lobe, even though it's not receiving any information from the eyes, it will still develop a sort of three-dimensional picture uh, for the blind person. So in that sense, the occipital lobe that changes its, its functions in blind people. But in sighted people, it's mostly involved with vision. Then the parietal lobe over here um, starts at the central sulcus, goes to the parietal occipital sulcus, and the, uh, post, uh, inferiorly, I mean, is the um, deep lateral sulcus. The parietal lobe is involved with um, integration of sensory input and the processing of sensory input. So, um, as mammals are, we have quite large bodies, slightly more complex structures. We're warm-blooded. We have a far more intimate relationship with our bodies than, say, cons uh, reptiles. Uh, reptiles' body temperature is more due uh, is more. Um, due to the environment and to um, homeostatic processes, whereas we have to have far more intense homeostatic processes to maintain um, our bodies. So it makes sense that we have a particularly well-developed parietal lobe. Um, so it receives all this input from our bodies and allows us to understand what's happening to our bodies, um, especially our post-central gyrus is sort of the stop um, for all signals coming in from the spine, all signals coming in from the spine will go through the brainstem, through the thalamus, and then to the postcentral gyrus. And say, if someone's pricking you in the hand, then you will feel it uh, in the postcentral gyrus. Um, when it hits the postcentral gyrus, you'll feel that prick, 
um, then the post central gyrus will send a signal to the rest of the parietal lobe where that sensation is going to be integrated. So it's not enough that your brain picks up that someone is sticking a pen into your hand. Uh, it also your parietal lobe will then also say, um, this is your right hand, it belongs to your body, and this prick um, is a painful sensation, and I'm going to send the sensation to the frontal lobe so that you can make the decision about whether you want to slap the person who's sticking this pin into your hand. So it's not just simple sensation, but also awareness of the sensation and what is your relationship to that sensation. And also the parietal lobe has a role to play in filtering out unnecessary information. So if you stay in a room with a loud ticking clock, um, there's a good chance that after a while, if you're really concentrating on your studying and your medical textbook, that after a while you won't even hear the clock anymore. It's not that the clock has stopped working, it's just your parietal lobe has decided this is, a, uh, this is a sound that is absolutely not necessary uh, to be hearing, so it uh, filters it out. Now the last structure is the frontal lobe, which is responsible for uh, planning, uh, for much of your personality, uh, much of your decisions, much, uh, much of your judgments, and also especially for motor functions. Uh, the precentral gyrus uh, is responsible for all your movements, so uh, your premotor cortex will say, okay, let's raise our right hand to ask the lecturer a question. It will send a s signal to the precentral gyrus and then um, a plan of um, moving the hand up will be made and that will be then sh sent down through the spine uh, to the hand in order to allow the hand to be raised. And um, also involved in memory and also has, a, um, has some role to play with emotions. And to be honest, uh, the frontal lobe is possibly the most complex structure out of all of these and it interacts in a quite complex way and to be honest I don't think uh, we fully understand how it works uh, we're just making rough guesses but uh, those are uh, the rough guesses we have made so far in terms of science. So let's go through a few clinical examples that illustrate the, the physiological functions of the different lobes starting with the temporal lobe um, we have mentioned that the temporal lobe is responsible for memory and uh, you know we know that Alzheimer's disease is a degenerative disorder of the brain where neurons start to die off and Alzheimer's tends to start in the temporal lobe so guess what Alzheimer's disease tends to start with forgetfulness and memory lapses um, another clinical example of our temporal lobe of the how the temporal lobe works is uh, something called temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, that's when you have a seizure focus in your temporal lobe. And if the, the seizure is confined to the temporal lobe and doesn't spread for the rest of the brain, you can have isolated um, uh, symptoms j uh, uh, just involving temporal lobe function. So when you have a seizure, you might suddenly smell um, roses in the room when there are actually no flowers at all. Um, if the seizure focuses on your emotional centers, you might have wild, crazy outbursts of emotion. Um, and in fact, you might actually think the patient is a uh, bipolar patient or having some sort of psychiatric disorder when they're actually just having a seizure uh, of the emotional centers of the brain. Um, a tumor of the temporal lobe might cause um, strange um, uh, smells uh, to be perceived where there are none. It might cause, um, uh, it might push on the hearing centers of the temporal lobe if you have a tumor, and uh, you might start um, hearing auditory hallucinations, having hearing problems uh, because of a lesion in the hearing centers of the temporal uh, lobe. So it's not necessarily that you have schizophrenia that you hear if you're hearing voices, or you might actually be having a temporal lobe lesion. Moving on to the insular lobe. Now, the insular lobe, as I mentioned, is a somewhat mysterious structure. And the problem with the insular lobe is that it's, uh, as far as I can see in the literature, quite often if there's a lesion in the insular lobe, there'll be a lesion somewhere else in the brain as well. It's hardly... Uh, 
it's hard to find a patient with an isolated insular lobe lesion. Um, so we're still not 100% sure exactly what is responsible from the insular lobe side and what is responsible for the other side as such, but um, insular lobe is responsible for language, integration of sensory information, um, and also awareness, and those things um, do go down with uh, certain dementias, and certain dementias do infect the insular lobe, um, so that is one way that uh, you can see if you suppress the function of the insular lobe, you have um, less language and uh, these patients also have less sort of um, desire or less sort of awareness of what's happening in their bodies. They don't feel cold, they don't feel hot, they don't feel pain, uh, or, uh, or rather they, they're, not, they're not able to really integrate it into their experience and they're not sure what to do with it. Next, the parietal lobe. Um, so that is also integration of sensory input and also defining the relationship with our sensory input. So if you have a stroke, for example, in a postcentral gyrus, you'll suddenly become numb in that particular area. If you get a stroke somewhere in the rest of the pari uh, parietal lobe, but not in that postcentral gyrus, you might lose your ability to integrate that information to your sense of self. Um, so this is a phenomenon called neglect. So what happens is that if you have, say, a stroke of the right parietal lobe of the, say, the superior lobule or inferior lobule, um, it might be that you st can still technically feel someone pricking your right, your uh, left hand, um, but when that signal goes to the post-central gyrus in the parietal lobe and says your hand is being pricked and then wants to send a signal to the rest of the parietal lobe that's had the stroke, you will not actually experience that pinprick as being part of your hand. It might be that the patient will claim that someone else's hand is being pricked or that uh, there is a hand being pricked but it's not their hand. That causes quite bizarre um, clinical presentations. And uh, it also might be uh, parietal lobe also integrates information from the environment so a person with a right parietal lobe stroke might start ignoring everything from the um, left hand side um, so if you it's not that they're blind but if you approach them from the left hand side although they see you they're unable to integrate it uh, into a sensation of I am seeing this person so they, uh, they will ignore you if you approach them from the left hand side and the moment you jump into the right hand side of their vision if the left parietal lobes are still intact they'll be like oh where did you come from um, they'll suddenly notice you because the left parietal lobe which is intact is able to take that visual stimulus and say there's a person standing in front of me uh, I'm surprised by this person and uh, I should probably say hi to this person Uh, going on to the occipital lobe and sighted individuals, the occipital lobe is responsible uh, for integration of visual stimuli in the condition called um, imminent eclampsia, which you probably learned about in your obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, you have very high blood pressure in the brain and for some reason in imminent eclampsia the occipital lobe is particularly vulnerable to that high blood pressure and as blood vessels start bursting in the occipital lobe and as pressure builds up in the occipital lobe uh, visions, uh, uh, vision processing um, becomes affected and patients will start seeing sparks flying in front of their eyes so that's got nothing to do with their retinas per se um, it seems to be more due to the pressure on the occipital lobe causing those sparks uh, that they see just before they have a convulsion. Um, and also uh, lesions of the occipital lobe might cause visual hallucinations, for example. In uh, blind people, the occipital lobe is not inactive. Uh, the occipital lobe develops the ability to, uh, or develops certain abilities to uh, create three-dimensional maps uh, in a person's mind's eye, as it were. So blind people also use the occipital lobes. Uh, what they do is they integrate sound information and touch information, and they're actually able to create three-dimensional maps inside the, uh, of their imagination. And the occipital lobe appears to be responsible for the ability to generate an internal map 
in blind people. So it's, n it's not uh, confirmed whether it has the same function in sighted people or whether this is a function that it develops only in the absence of, uh, uh, of vision, but uh, blind people also uh, use the occipital lobes, but it has a different function in blind people. Then the last lobe is the frontal lobe. Uh, which is involved with uh, motor functions and some emotions and planning. Um, if you whack a person on the head with a hammer on the frontal lobe, you might cause permanent personality changes and um, and uh, and so forth. Um, a person with an epileptic focus in the frontal lobe um, might ex uh, exhibit bizarre behavior every time they have a seizure or an absence attack uh, every time they have a seizure. Persons with tumors in the frontal lobe will start developing bizarre abnormalities of planning and language and motor functions which might be um, misdiagnosed as schizophrenia and some uh, types of dementia actually start in the frontal lobe um, and then rather than presenting first with a memory loss like Alzheimer's, a frontal lobe dementia will first present with bizarre and drastic personality changes first as a sign of that dementia. So those were just briefly a few clinical examples just to illustrate how um, the physiology or the functions of the different parts of the brain tie in with um, clinical scenarios that you might experience. Uh, encounter uh, when you are uh, big doctors one day. Uh, there's a few structures I haven't discussed in, uh, in this lecture, but I just want you to take note of them. Um, first of all, the limbic system, which is responsible for emotions. Most of it is um, buried in the temporal lobe. That is going to be discussed in a separate lecture uh, regarding emotion. Um, there's a structure called the basal ganglia. Um, but that is also going to be covered in a separate lecture. That is quite important uh, in terms of movement regulation. And the cerebellum I've also touched on in this lecture, but we'll go into that more detail um, in a separate lecture. And there's a few other structures, but um, those three are the three big ones that uh, you guys will need to know uh, that I haven't really properly discussed in this lecture. So please look forward to the next few exciting episodes.